Read. What did Francis Bacon say? Reading maketh a full man. Conference a ready man and writing an exact man. Reading makes a full person. Who wants to go through life empty? Who wants to go through life half empty or half full? The, the, the truth of that is, though, that uh, what you read is what you're full of. And life is too short. Life is far too short to spend your time reading trash. Um, there are too many good books in the world to spend your time reading the not so good books. I have, I, I have a number of books that I plan to read. And I just started on two, and I kind of alternate between them. Um, when I retired in 1995, I, I said, I want to spend more time reading biography. And so I, when I get through with this set, I'm going to subscribe to the, uh, uh, the set that Easton's putting out on the great lives. I won't, won't uh, get all of them. But uh, yes, our own Longfellow was right when he said in the Psalm <coughs> of Life, that lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time footprints which perhaps another sailing o'er life solemn name some forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing may take heart again yes, what you read is what you're full of and some people read trash and become full of trash Life's too short, and life is too rich and meaningful to do that. Yes, Polonius asked Hamlet. You remember, he saw Hamlet reading. He said, "What do you read, my lord?" And Hamlet, in his miserable, <coughs> mocking way, which Polonius was deserving of, said. Words, words, words. If I was wrong, he said, that sticks and stones may break my bones, and words will never faze me. It's not true. There are few things more powerful than words. And my, my belief is that the essence of the word has to be spiritual. When you reduce a word, you get past the sound vibrations and how it's made, you know, whether you may be a mental or palate or whatever kind of word it is, when you get past those things, at bottom, the word is spiritual. Um, and, and along with that reading, I would urge you to develop your vocabulary. Is, uh, there are perhaps few things more distressing, at least in conversation, few things more distressing than to have a, a beautiful, maybe a sublime thought and be unable to find just the right word. Uh, isn't that interesting? Have you ever wondered about <coughs> what comes first, the words or the thoughts? Have you ever wondered whether you can think without words? Well, on the one hand, you think, yeah, I can think without words. But then you say, well, then somebody says, well, if you think, can think without words, what do you think in? If you don't think in words, what do you think in? Well, yeah. But then somebody said, well, but haven't you said, wait, I've got this thought, let me find the words to put it in. It sounds like thought precede words. And what I'm saying there is, you see this stool? I don't, I, I don't know that stool standing here. Oh, well, I know it's a stool. But I don't really know that stool when I stand here. I mean, before I can say I know that stool, I've got to see it from all sides, right? From all angles. Now, truth is a lot like that. And life is a lot like that. 
And that's why, incidentally, that's how schools of thought, whether it's literary criticism or whatever, that's how schools of thought develop, is people look at something that stands still. They don't see the whole. So, you know, um, as you as you read and as you converse with people, you are developing a vocabulary. And you ought to not be content with anything less than the best vocabulary you can develop. I remember when I was oh, sixth grade or something like that, and I had this old worn out, the covers were called, dictionary that I kept at my desk. And every time in my reading or when the teacher was speaking that I heard a word or saw a word I didn't know, not know what I mean, I would look it up. And I, met, I made that a practice. That, that was the beginning of the practice that I've continued to this very day. And, you know, there's, there are so many good words in the English language. 600,000 now words in the English language. There are too many there for you and me to falter looking for words. We crush ourselves. And you have, you have exquisite thoughts. I know you do. What you want to do is try to hide the words to match when there's exquisite thoughts. So read, read, and read. I'd also suggest that, that there are some things you ought to avoid, some things that I want to avoid, and that is extremes. Avoid extremes. Uh, I have uh, long been a, a devotee of the, the classical world, the, the world of Greek and Roman classics. And one of the things that I enjoyed so much when I came to York College in 1968 was to begin to read some things that I wanted to read for a long time but never had the opportunity. And I began to read that Greek and Roman mythology and I began to teach Homer and, uh, and so on. And I have always been amazed at the fertility of the Greek imagination. You remember, if you read Homer's Odyssey, you remember that, that uh, the Straits of Messina were very dangerous for wayfarer, for, for seafaring people. <coughs> and you remember when <coughs> Odysseus and his companions sailed through the Straits of Messina, they knew that there was danger there because on the one hand, there was a many-headed monster called the Scylla and on the other hand, there was this swirling whirlpool called the Charybdis. Well, the, 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 the care with which sailors had to go through that meant that they had to go straight through, not veer off to the right or to the left, because if they went off to the one hand, the many-headed monster, and sure enough, it happened to Odysseus and his commander that the monster reached out and swallowed some of his men. And uh, then they got too far on the other side, and sure enough, they went down uh, the pool and uh, shipwrecked. Finally, Odysseus was the only one who was uh, washed ashore. Right. Now, now, why did the Greeks develop this notion of the Scylla and the Charybdis? Well, it seems to me that they were illustrating what uh, later Aristotle came to enunciate as the golden mean. And the golden mean simply uh, says, nothing to excess. Have you noticed already in, in your assessment of life, have you noticed already how easy it is for a virtue to become a vice? And why does a virtue become a vice? Because the golden mean is not observed. I think the golden mean runs like a golden thread all the way through the Bible. And you can study uh, history of Israel, you can study uh, the biography of various individuals and, and you will see it illustrated. Uh, 